thanks for showing up during the dog days of the summer. Uh, I know everybody's out doing vacation type stuff. Uh, today's speaker, once again, Jeff Plesha from APL. He'll be talking about the lunar interior, and you're going to find out we don't know a whole lot about that lunar interior. And um, the interior has its uh, goals and recommendations. As a matter of fact, there's a whole goal uh, from the National Research Council on the lunar interior broken up into sub-goals. And the NASA Advisory Council had a recommendation that we should probably establish a network to uh, better understand this interior. And Jeff's going to talk a little bit about this in his presentation. So, Jeff? Hey, this is probably the uh, most esoteric of the talks. Um, but I'll try to give you an idea of uh, what do we know about the interior of the moon and um, what, what are the outstanding questions and what might we accomplish in the future. Next slide. Okay, this is just a summary of the, the basic data of the moon. This, most of these things are, are pretty well known, have been known for a long time. The size of the moon, the equatorial flattening, center of figure, center of mass offset, um, the average density, moments of inertia. This stuff provides a sort of baseline um, that any, any studies of the interior, any models of the interior certainly have to um, match what we know observationally about the moon. Next slide. I thought what would be good to do is, is sort of review what we know about the interior of the moon with the same fidelity we know about the interior of the Earth. Next slide. <laughs> Which is to say nothing. Um, we, we have quite a number of, of data sets. Next slide. Um, that have been collected by various orbiting spacecraft and Apollo. Um, we understand the topography pretty well. This is the topography uh, based on uh, Clementine, where the front side is, is dominated by the mare at a relatively low pieces of the highlands. Uh, on the far side is mostly highlands. This is the South Pole Aiken Basin and, and topographically high uh, far side. Next slide. This is what the uh, Selene Cayuga spacecraft has produced uh, from their orbital altimetry. It's a somewhat different projection. Here you can see the South Pole Aiken Basin on the, the far side in the southern hemisphere, the, the front side in the low uh, Mari region, the generally high um, uh, highlands on the far side extending over here into the, onto the near side. Um, the topography data, um, they've stopped collecting topography data on this mission because they're having problems with the, the laser altimeter it was starting to fail, so they turned it off uh, in the hopes that uh, they can use what's left of it uh, to fill in some gaps in the future. Um, the, the Japanese have released to NASA the gravity and topography to use for planning, but they have not public, uh, publicly released the data other than these, the topographic maps like this that have been uh, posted on their website. Next slide. We also understand, this is the gravity sort of from Clementine up to uh, before the, the Japanese mission. The Japanese mission is in a circular polar orbit, and they've got two small subsatellites to do both the front and far side gravity. Dave Smith at Goddard has been, been working on that analysis, um, and that has not yet been completed or released. But basically what you can see is um, the, the lunar mass cons, these large high gravity areas over the, uh, the Mare, these have been known for a long time and are, are assumed to be due to something um, in the mantle where there's a thinner crust and the mantle pokes up as well as the fill by the, uh, the Mare basalts and you can see the sort of spotty coverage on the backside. When you get back over here um, it becomes uh, really very very uncertain as to what's going on because this is an extrapolation to the far side based on the data from the front side. You can see you can track the, the spacecraft going over the poles or around the limb a little bit onto the far side and essentially do a spherical harmonic fit to the data and what you get on the back side is this but this is largely noise and in fact you can see some of the noise propagated because these are the the Apollo um, ground tracks so we we don't from the pre uh, Japanese data really understand what the far side gravity is we'll have a much better understanding of that um, in the future we're not going to know much better the front side gravity because we had a fairly good idea of what that was already next slide this is a Clementine magnetometer data. There is some residual magnetic uh, effects on the moon. I'll talk about that in some more detail later. The next slide. We, we have from things like both the Apollo mission and the Clem or, and lunar prospector data some idea what the distribution of, of different uh, chemical elements are from the radioactive decay. This is a thorium map, and you can see most of the thorium is concentrated in the Mare areas on the front side a little bit associated with the South Pole Aiken Basin on the front side, and the highlands are relatively low in, in thorium. Next slide. 
We also have the samples from uh, Apollo, from the, the lunar Soviet missions that return samples. There are a couple of dozen or so lunar meteorites that provide um, samples, although we don't know exactly where they came from. And the return samples include both regolith um, as well as rock material. Next slide. We have a first order understanding of the, of the geology of the moon, largely from photogeologic studies, but supplemented by the uh, by remote sensing data, both chemical as well as spectral data, um, and what we've learned from, from a variety of missions. And what you can see is the red is the, the Mari basalts. Um, the highlands material is, is mapped in a variety of different colors. You can see the young impact craters are yellow. Um, some of the older impact craters are in blue. This is the South Pole um, Aiken Basin here in this projection on the limb. Um, and the highlands terrain sort of in, in a variety of shades of, of brown and yellows. Next slide. And then there's also rampant speculation. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, one thing to, to bear in mind is, is this is all geophysics. Um, and, and this little joke aside, um, it, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff is very model dependent. And, and as I go through some of the different data sets, you'll see that people have come up with different answers for the, the, the thickness of the crust, different um, understandings of whether there's a core, how big there's a, the core is, whether the inner and outer core is solid or liquid, what their radius is. It's because it's all model dependent and basically we have very little data. Next slide. Okay. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our understanding and modeling of the moon comes from the current idea of what the origin of the moon is. And that, this has been talked about in some of the earlier lectures, but basically the idea is that very early on, uh, an object about the size of Mars ran into the Earth um, and created a, a large catastrophic event that, that ejected a lot of material into circum-Earth orbit, which coalesced to form the moon. Next slide. Um, this giant impact theory explains a, a fair amount of, of what we understand about the moon. Uh, the absence of a large iron core is because all the Earth's iron was already in its core, and whatever iron was associated uh, with the projectile uh, stayed with the Earth. Uh, the bulk density of the moon is about 3.3 because the moon was largely derived from the mantles of the projectile and the Earth, and that's consistent with the densities of those objects. Um, the isotopic composition is, is different. Uh, from other bodies in the solar system, but is similar to the Earth because the Earth is sort of a collection of the original Earth and this new body. And we have an approximate idea of, of when this occurred. It would have been very early on in the solar system, perhaps during the first 100 million years or so of, of activity. Um, there have been other ideas um, out there to explain the origin of the moon. One is simple capture that, that was formed somewhere else, happened to wander by the Earth, get caught up in the Earth's gravitational field, and, and go into orbit. Um, another one is that uh, it was originally part of the Earth, and the spinning of the Earth spewed off this material, which formed the moon, and, and that they both formed in about the same place in the solar system at about the same time. But right now, the, the giant impact theory is the one that um, seems to be the, the most accepted. Next slide. This is a, a model of what, what it might have looked like. This was done uh, some years ago, but essentially it's, it's still pretty much the same. You had a large body hit the, hit the Earth. It's something of a glancing blow. Um, enormous amounts of material were spewed off uh, from the impact, and you can see as the thing rotates, you form this uh, sort of dogleg debris field that, that r quite rapidly gets spread out around the moon. This, all of these sequences, this occurs over the first 24 hours after impact. So it was a, it was a fairly quick event, and it didn't take long for the material to coalesce um, into what's, what was the proto-moon. Next slide. <clears throat> One of the results of, of the... Uh, this is that you get what's referred to as the magma ocean. As a result of the, the uh, coalesces of material, um, you get at least the outer part of the moon being completely molten. And so you've got a, a, an outer layer that, that's a silicate liquid like a lava or a magma body um, coating the entire moon and possibly extending down to 500 kilometers or more. There's arguments to also to the effect that the entire moon was, was molten. But, but I think generally accepted is the fact that at least the, the upper few hundred kilometers uh, were molten right after the, the moon formed. As this um, molten mass began to solidify, um, different minerals condensed out of the um, liquid. You had plagioclase, which is a relatively low density mineral, a lot of aluminum and oxygen. It floated to the surface. Uh, the more mafic minerals like olivine and pyroxene sank to the, to the bottom of the, the ocean. Eventually the whole thing crystallized uh, one, one residual amount of liquid called creep, which has a, a high potassium and rare earth elements and phosphorus content, it was sort of a residual amount of material, 
um, was somewhere down in the, the mantle and, and then solidified, and subsequently the moon has been, been cratered uh, since then. And the idea is that this, this sort of composition with plagioclase near the top and, and more matic material on the bottom generally fits the, the data we have about the rocks and, and some of the seismic and, and other data for the interior of the moon. Um, next slide. Now, that, that's at a very gross scale. When you look at it in a little more detail, uh, there's probably a lot of intrusions and little different north acidic bodies in the upper part of the crust. This is a cartoon that uh, Paul Spudis came up with and was, was redrafted in Hawaii. But basically, you can see a whole series of north acidic bodies uh, largely composed of the, the mineral northite um, forming the upper crust. Um, little plutons, more mafic material coming in as intrusions, and, and mafic material coming out to fill the, um, the Mari basins, at least on the front side. Um, next slide. This, this creep material that was a leftover residual um, liquid at the end of the solidification of the magma ocean subsequently have, has melted and come up and produced magma bodies in the Mari and stuff um, in a few isolated areas which are very, very enhanced in the radioactive elements and are sort of a compositional anomaly. So th this is sort of our general understanding of what the, the, the composition of the crust is made of and, and how it formed. So largely based on, on theory and the return samples and some thermal modeling. Next slide. Okay, the, the, to look at the moon sort of from the outside in, um, the surface is covered by what's referred to as the regolith or the mega regolith. Um, across the entire moon, there's a layer, uh, some, some meters to kilometers thick, of, of shattered, broken up, uh, fragmental material. On the Mari surfaces, that layer is only a few meters thick. Uh, because it all formed since the, the, the Mari basalts were in place, and, and those are, as things go, relatively young on the moon. They're 3.3 3 or 4 or 5 or 2 billion years ago, and, and most of the cratering occurred before that, and so that fragmental layer is relatively thin. When you get into the highlands of the moon, the north acidic crust, um, that's been around since the moon solidified uh, 4.5 billion years ago, and it's had a lot of time to, to be broken up by impact, both sort of small craters in the, in the kilometer and tens of kilometer size as well as the giant impact basins which have mixed all this material up. And the, the assumption is that in the highlands um, there is a, could be kilometers of broken up rock. Next slide. What that looks like in cross section is this. I showed the same cartoon the last time. Um, this upper few meters of regolith is typically very finely ground up, very few large rocks. This occurs on, on both the highlands and the and on the Mari, but as you go down in the highlands, you get into a, a series of blocks and, and disturbed but largely in place blocks and into fractured um, sort of primary crust, if you will. And this whole broken up layer is certainly kilometers thick. It might be three or four or five or, or maybe 10 kilometers thick. Um, it's not entirely clear. Um, presumably, this kind of, at least this part of it, also occurs underneath the, the Mari basalts. The question is, uh, how much cratering was there between uh, the actual formation of the impact basin and the subsequent filling by the, uh, the basalts themselves? Um, it's also possible that within the, the Mari, there are regolith layers that are trapped between basalt flows. If you had a sufficient amount of time uh, between eruptions, you could actually generate a regolith. Uh, there's some compositional variations associated with the mega regolith. Some of the areas are, uh, are high in iron and other areas are low in iron. Um, and so some of it can be mapped um, in remote sensing. Um, from a seismic perspective, when you look at the seismic energy, there's a lot of scattering. Um, the properties are very different from crystalline rocks, uh, particularly in the upper few uh, kilometers and especially in the very near surface. There's a lot of scattering um, in the seismic energy. Next slide. And you can see this couple pictures of the highlands here, lots and lots of craters that have continuously uh, turned this material over and broken it up. Typically, uh, an impact crater will excavate down um, about a, a third or so or a quarter of its diameter. And so a 10-kilometer crater is going to excavate down several kilometers and repeatedly turn over this material and, and keep mixing it up. You can also see in this Apollo picture, you can see material ejected out of the basins. And so not only do you have the local disruption of material and grinding up, but you also have a lot of debris thrown out of the giant impact basins that, that cover the surface. And you can see the nice texture, the stuff coming out of uh, one of the basins in this slide. Next slide. OK, so what do we know about the, the, shallow, the shallow part of the crust of the moon? Um, 
the, the seismic experiments that were done on the Apollo mission consisted of a variety of things. One of them was a sort of passive experiment where they emplaced seismometers and they looked at um, impact events and, and moonquakes and, and understood what the, the surface properties were. Some of the later missions had uh, active experiments where they launched little grenades and stuff to get uh, the velocities. And, and the structure that was observed is that near the surface, within the first few hundred meters, the velocities are very low, 100 meters per second, which is very low when a typical seismic velocity in a solid rock is, is many kilometers, two, three, four, five kilometers per second, depending on, on what kind of rock it is. So these are very low. Um, as you go deeper, it begins to become a little higher, up into two or three hundred <coughs> meters per second. Um, eventually, at the Apollo uh, 17, 17 site, once you get down below a kilometer or so, it gets up into about four, four kilometers per second. Um, and this is the result of the surface fragmental layer that's just broken up rubble that has very low, low velocity, and the two correlate. Um, what you can see in this sort of cartoon from the Apollo 17 experiment, here's the valley floor here. Uh, they landed over here. Here's the south massif in this cartoon. So the profile runs across like that. You can see this uh, f shallow layer that fills the valley floor. Um, it's a couple hundred meters thick with very low velocity, 250 or so meters per second. Underneath it is a somewhat higher velocity, 1,200 meters per second, suggesting that the stuff is more uh, compound, compacted and, and um, less broken up. And then you get into the original Highlands crust here, which is around 4,000 meters per second. So it's, it's even less um, broken up. But one of the things that was observed is as you go down, the velocity increases, but it doesn't increase. If you just take powder and compress it, you'll increase the velocity. But it doesn't increase um, in a manner consistent with just taking the surface regolith powder and, and compressing it. There's got to be more blocks, more blocks in place so that you get an average higher overall velocity. Next slide. The thickness of the regolith, as I said, increases with time. These are some models uh, people have made about um, how much cratering there's been on the surface, but the, the, they all sort of indicate about the same thing. For a surface like the Mari that's about 3.5 or 3.6 billion years old, you've got some few meters, maybe 10 meters of, of broken up material, and then you get back presumably into the uh, relatively undisturbed basalt. In the highlands terrain, uh, because it was, uh, it's been around, it's been solidified for over 4 billion years, and because the cratering rate was so much greater early on, you've got a much thicker um, regolith layer that, that could be, depending on exactly what age you pick, um, certainly hundreds of meters to maybe a few kilometers thick. And depending on exactly what the geologic history was in a particular location, um, whether you're sitting on what was or is a basin floor or on the, the rim where the ejecta was, um, the fragmental layer is going to be thinner or thicker by, by up to kilometers. Next slide. A lot of what we know about the interior of the moon comes from the seismic experiments that were done during Apollo. As I said, and a lot of this, particularly the, the, what we know about the deep interior, comes from the, the moonquakes as well as the impact um, of, of the, the upper part of the LEM and the S4B um, that was used to get them to the moon. Those were all sent back into the moon um, and, and were, were good because it was, they were, their location where they impacted was known as well as the amount of kinetic energy that was in place in the ground was known. So they're very good for calibrating the velocities and, and some of the structures. The problem is that um, despite the fact that they were pretty big, they're actually very low density. Um, most of it was just empty tanks by the time they, uh, they impacted, and, and so there wasn't a, a whole lot of energy uh, implanted compared to what you might have done with some other kind of an experiment, but, but they were good. This is what the seismometer looks like. It's actually underneath this little uh, tinfoil uh, thermal protection. It was set up on a little uh, on the ground, leveled, and then covered with this material to uh, keep the uh, keep the heat off because because the seismometer was very sensitive and without the thermal blanket all you would have seen is the, the heating and cooling of the seismometer. Next slide. There are basically three types of uh, of quakes that were observed. There's actually a fourth which I'll get to, but there's a, what are referred to as deep moon quakes, shallow moon quakes, and impact events which are uh, you know largely meteorites, although there were a few uh, spacecraft impact events that were were done. Um, the deep impacts are, are relatively low magnitude. Um, uh, the, the shallow quakes are much higher magnitude, and the impact events, some of them were, were fairly significant. The, the difference between seismicity on the moon and on the Earth is the seismicity on the, a given earthquake event 
um, lasts a long time on the moon, largely because the moon is dry. Um, it has what's referred to as a very high Q, so there's very low attenuation of the seismic event, and so the moon, is, it's been referred to, it rings like a bell when, it, when there's a moonquake or when it's hit by something. In fact, uh, the, when the S4B um, hit, it was detected for over four hours in the seismic records. So um, there's, it's, it's, I mean, uh, it's not like you could actually feel it, but, but you can record it instrumentally for a long period of time. Next slide. There, as I said, there, there are deep moonquakes, shallow moonquake impact events. There are also what have been referred to as thermal moonquakes, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes. Um, the deep moonquakes are relatively low energy, magnitude two or less. Um, some 7,000 or so were recorded over the s six or seven years that the Apollo ALSEP stations were, were active. Um, they occur fairly, uh, fairly deep in the lower part of the mantle, and they also occur at very regular intervals. I'll come back to that in a minute. There are shallow moonquakes, which are much stronger, um, magnitude five or so, up to that, they're, they're relatively shallow, you know, 50 or a couple hundred kilometers in the lunar mantle, um, but they're very rare. Over the course of, um, of the Apollo um, um, ALSEP activity, only 28 of them were recorded. Um, so you get about one magnitude five moonquake per year. Um, but like, although they're shallow, their depths are not well constrained. And the problem with the Apollo seismic network was it's all closely spaced stations on one side of the moon and that limits your ability to determine the locations of, of, of activity on the far side and that's one of the things that something like a network mission would hopefully would uh, would resolve and then there are impact events and some you know 1700 events were recorded over the lifetime of the ALSEP uh, ranging from uh, little you know gra hundreds of gram impacts to to one event that was a, a metric ton but the, uh, the amount of seismic energy is, is many, many orders of magnitude less than the Earth. Um, and these numbers for the moon vary by a couple orders of magnitude, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11th, but it's still way below what we have on the Earth. Next slide. Okay, as I said, the shallow moonquakes are, are very strong, um, but they're uh, relatively rare, um, and they're very large stress drops, which suggests that whatever, whatever's going on, there's a lot of stress associated with their release. The deep moonquakes are, are very small events. They're barely above the detection level of the instrumentation, um, and they're very deep, but they're localized, whereas the, the shallow moonquakes appear to occur sort of randomly uh, around the moon. The deep <coughs> events are clustered into what have been referred to as nests, um, and, and some recent analysis, reanalysis of the seismic data suggests that there's, there's 100 or 150 or so um, of these nests. 115 of them are on the near side, about 50 of them are, are on the far side. Um, some of the original ones are in doubt. Um, there are only a few, though, that have sufficient number of events and locations such that they're accurately known where they are. There's a, a large uncertainty in where these actually occur in both depth and uh, on the moon, but they, they do occur in small clusters, and, and two of them um, are on the far side, have a, have a fair amount of, uh, of uh, statistics. Um, there should be plus or minus, so they occur at about 880 and, and 1100 kilometers depth on the far side. There are two clusters on the, on the limb. As I said, they're very closely tied to the orbit of the moon. Um, with about a 27 day period, they occur and then they go away and they reoccur again. And it has to do with the tidal effects on the moon and, and different um, different parameters. One of them is uh, the Earth-Moon distance variation over the course of the month. The other one is uh, the where, where the uh, Earth is in longitude on the Moon and where the Moon is in latitude on the Moon. And these things work together to produce um, essentially two periods, one at 27 and a half days and one at 27.2 days. Um, so these are clearly associated with, with the, the Earth-Moon tidal interaction. The shallow quakes are similar to what you would see on the Earth. They're tectonic events because of stress building up on the moon. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're, um, they're impact events. Um, they're also clearly associated with the, the known uh, meteorite swarms. I'll show you that in a, in a moment. Um, and the largest event that was ever recorded was, a, um, was near the Apollo 14 site, and it was an impact event with something about 1,100 kilograms model coming in at um, 22 kilometers per second. At the Apollo 17 site, one of the things that was observed was that there were a whole lot of little tiny events 
uh, relatively low energy as seismic events go, um, th but they're very correlated with the time of day. Most of the events occur near noon. Um, the largest events occur near noon, and the most events occur right at sunset. But they're all right around the, the site, and exactly what causes these is, is not clear. One possibility is just the thermal heating of the rocks causes the rocks to, to crack. Um, another idea is that there's something associated with minor landslides. Um, one option is the tectonic events. The, the seismic signature, though, of these events are all identical, which means what's ever causing them, it's the same process over and over and over again which kind of rules out tectonics because the, the patterns are always a little different because exactly how the rocks break and the orientation of the fault is always a little different. So the, there's some, some presumably <laughs> thermal activity going on, um, but exactly what the cause is is still not clear. Next slide. This just shows you what the distribution of moonquakes and shallow quakes are. The deep moonquakes are here on the left. These are the little nests. There are actually lots and lots of quakes associated with each little nest. Um, in the case of the shallow quakes, these are, in fact, the single epicenters associated with uh, those. This triangle here are the Apollo seismic stations. Um, it essentially works out to be a triangle because the, the 12 and 14 seismometers were so close as to be indistinguishable um, for this kind of analysis. But the, the, the shallow events occur on both the, the far side and the near side. Most of the observed ones are on the... Are on the um, are on the far side. Um, it's not clear whether that's somehow uh, an instrumentation observation problem or whether, in fact, they are uh, tr truly distributed on the far side. Next slide. This is what the, um, those, those thermal quakes are at the Apollo 17 site. This kind of shows over the course of the day, most of the events occur at, at sunset with, with almost none occurring near sunrise. It's kind of a histogram, so the taller the the column, the more events. Um, as I said, the largest events, although there are fewer of them, occur near noon. Uh, when you look at the number of, of earthquakes or moonquakes um, over the course of a year, um, you see peaks and associated with different meteorite showers. This is, these are all the meteorite showers um, in these bars. Um, this curve labeled radar events are the, the meteorite radar tracks that were observed on the Earth. And you can see that um, there are correlations here. Here's the number of moonquakes observed that are attributed to impacts and behind all this, these lines you can see the radar events on the Earth go way up. So it's clearly, they're clearly associated with, uh, with impact events on the Moon um, and now as, as a result of some of the observations on the Moon you can clearly see these little flashes going off on the Moon when you, when you watch it during impact, uh, during meteor showers and you can see these little, little lights popping up where little events are occurring. So we, we know... Um, the uh, graph on the right, is that tip, uh, just a particular snapshot that it doesn't follow that pattern yearly? Y yes, that's, that's sort of an, an average over the course of uh, all seven years. So year to year, they're, they're highly correlated, and, and they're also correlated with the meteor showers. So it's, it's periodic, so another set of seven years would look the same? More or less, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, if you, if you observe any meteor or shower, from the Earth year to year, there's some variation because um, it depends on where the Earth is actually intersecting that stream of debris. So there's going to be variation year to year. But, but every year, um, the Geminids shower occurs at the same time. And the number of meteorites you observe on the Earth goes up, and the number of events you would observe on the Moon would go up. Thank you. Next slide. OK, what do we know about the crust? We returned um, several hundred kilograms of material from the Moon in terms of rocks. And, uh, and soil. Uh, most, of the, most of the crust that we, uh, we know about the moon is, is a nor this is a north site from Apollo 16. Um, most of the places we went, though, were actually on the mare. Next slide. We know from the chemistry um, that, that most of it's silicon. There's a fair amount of titanium. Um, the aluminum is highly correlated with what kind of terrain you're on. In the, in the bas most of these are, are basalts. Um, you know, 10 or, 10 or so percent of aluminum. When you get up into the highlands, which is the anorthosite, goes up to 30 percent. On the other hand, most of the iron is, and, and magnesium is concentrated in the, uh, in the more mafic basalts um, and is relatively low in the uh, anorthosite. Next slide. I, I don't expect anybody to, to remember this or really pay any attention to it, but the point is that um, the anorthositic rock types that are largely composed of uh, 
plagioclase are the dominant rock types in the in the highlands in the upper and lower crust of the moon and that's because of the the magma ocean idea where you had this this largely molten outer part of the moon um, the plagioclase is the lightest mineral that floated to the surface whereas all the mafic stuff the olivines and pyroxenes that someday would become extruded as the uh, the Mari basalts, all that stuff went fairly deep. And so most of the material you, you see on the surface or it's been excavated and tossed around um, in the highlands is the anorthosidic kind of rock types. Next slide. Now, the, the thickness of the crust is, is something that's of, of a lot of interest from a, a lunar geology perspective because it indicates things about um, how the moon solidified, what its internal structure is, um, and how the whole moon evolved. But there's a fair amount of uncertainty associated with this. During the Apollo mission, they, they had the seismometers active. There were both active and passive events, um, as well as the impact events. And, and the, the numbers they got for crustal thickness were somewhere between, um, were, were on the high side around 50 or 60 kilometers. People have gone back recently and reanalyzed all those data um, and have come up with somewhat more shallow or, or thinner crusts on the order of 30 or so kilometers to 40 kilometers depending on where you are. There's a whole bunch of different ways people have, have looked at the same data set as well as uh, looking at the topography and the geoid um, data and, and modeled it in a whole bunch of different ways. And what you can see is that um, there's a huge scatter in the amount of data. It ranges from, from 60 to 70 to 50 down to the low 30s in places depending upon uh, where you are. Um, the crust under the, the impact basins um, is generally thinner than it is elsewhere, uh, particularly under the, um, the South Pole Aiken Basin where it might be, depending on which model you look at, it might be real, very, very thin. Next slide. This is what one model of the crustal thickness looks like. Um, you can see that there's an average of around, um, you know, 40-ish kilometers on the far side. In the highlands, it gets up considerably higher, maybe, you know, 70 kilometers or so. The South Pole Aiken Basin down here has very thin crust, as do the, um, the impact basins on the, on the front side. Um, and, and this sort of makes sense. I mean, the South Pole Aiken Basin is the largest impact basin in the solar system. It excavated, you know, a considerable depth, heaved all that material out. Probably a lot of this topography is due to that material. And, and so most of the crust was removed. Um, from there. Smaller impact basins on the front side that were subsequently filled by the, uh, the Mari basalts were the same kind of event. You dug out a bunch of the, the crust and, and tossed it away. Um, you can see the holes on the far side um, where some of these basins occurred that did essentially the, the same thing. But this is, this is a particular model and someone else could make a different set of assumptions to come up with a slightly different version of the model. To first order though, they all have the same um, appearance in that places under the, like the South Pole Aiken Basin is thin and the far side highlands are thicker. But exactly what number you want to attach to that depends on exactly which set of parameters you assume in the model. Next slide. What do we know about the crust? Well, we know it's extremely anorthosidic. Most of the rocks are north, anorthosite of one form or another, very high in aluminum, very low in iron, um, mostly made up of plagioclase. Um, the, the surface regolith is a little more mafic because there's some admixture from other materials. Um, the composition and what we know about the interior um, is consistent with the magma ocean model. Um, and we know that the velocity increases as you go down through the crust into the mantle. Now one of the things that's of consequence to geophysics, has very little relevance to designing spacecraft, is that the center of figure of the moon is offset from the center of mass. And that's because the crust on the far side is thicker than it is on the on the near side that faces the Earth, and so the center of mass is, is mostly associated with the dense interior, and is is offset from the center of figure. The center of figure is a little farther away, about two kilometers farther away from the Earth than the center of mass is, which affects the gravity field somewhat. Next slide. What do we know about the Mare thickness? Well, we know that there's some amount of of basaltic uh, lavas filling the the impact basins. A variety of different schemes have been used to try to understand how thick it was. One of the first attempts was by Rene Dehan, who looked at craters that were partially buried by the lava flows. Um, there's a relationship between the height of the crater rim and its diameter, and you can, you can look for craters that are almost completely buried, and, and at that point you can say, well, this is a, 
a 50 kilometer crater and the rim ought to be 300 meters high and the crater is just about buried so the lavas are 300 meters thick there. You can do that for a variety of places and he came up with numbers of two, three, four hundred meters in most places. Um, in Prosolarum it was a little bit thicker, uh, maybe a kilometer. Um, now Fred Hertz from across the way over here uh, thought well maybe the, those crater rims have been eroded somewhat and so maybe these are overestimates by maybe a hundred meters or so. Um, another technique was to use the gravity data. Um, this was done by Williams and Zuber a couple years ago. Um, they got much, much thicker estimates of the Mare fill kilometers in places in Imbrium over five kilometers. Um, back on the Apollo mission, there was a radar sounder that Roger Phillips, I believe, was the PI on, um, where they was a, uh, they sounded the the Mare as they went over with the command module, and they got they saw layering in the in the Mare um, in Serenitatis at 900 and 1600 meters, in Prosolarum at at 600 and and a thousand meters. Um, so there are layers within the in the Mare basalts. The question is, what are those layers? Are they just inner, regolith inner beds within the Mare uh, fill because there was some gap in time and you developed a little regolith that reflected the, the, the radar data back? Or is it in fact, is the deepest reflector that they saw the, the bottom of the Mare pile? The, we, don't, we don't know, but in any event, the thickness of these layers is considerably less than what the gravity data were modeled as, but more closely related to what um, Renata Hahn came up with early on. In any event, whether they're two or three kilometers or two or three hundred meters, um, the volume of the Mare basalts is incredibly tiny compared to uh, the rest of the crust. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very uh, obvious where they occur on the front side, but they're volumetrically minor. And most of them occurred fairly early on in, in lunar history. Um, there are return samples which have been dated. Um, if you take the number of craters on the surface and make models of how old that indicates. There are places that suggest that there might be uh, Mare basalts that are considerably younger um, th than the, the 3.4 or 5 billion years, but um, we don't know. Next slide. What do we know about the mantle? Well, mostly what we know about the mantle comes from the seismic uh, record. Um, these kind of, of, uh, of velocity profiles, this is one analysis that was done, and, and the range here is a probability. You know, if you pick, went down the center of this, this is what the typical model would suggest, and the, the shades of blue represent uh, uncertainties, statistical uncertainties that, that would be consistent with the data um, with, with, you know, outliers, if you will. And basically what happens is the, the P wave velocity um, increases up to, you know, seven or eight kilometers per second when you get down into the, into the deeper part of the mantle. Here's the base of the crust up here. Most of the shallow moonquakes occur in, in this zone. The deep moonquakes occur down here, um, and there's a discontinuity at five, about 500 kilometers. Yeah, John. Can you just briefly tell them the difference between a P wave and an S wave? Oh, all right. Yeah, the P wave is a compressional wave. Um, it's like a sound wave. An S wave is a shear wave, um, which essentially goes side to side. P waves are transmitted through anything. Uh, S waves don't go through, through liquids. Um, and the seismometer, is that good enough? Uh, okay. Um, one of the things that's, um, as, you, as you go deeper into the, into the mantle, you can take a given mineral and compress it more and more. In some cases, it will change from one mineral form to another. Um, olivine will transition into spinel, but one of the things that w was observed is that uh, the velocities change in a way that suggests there has to be a fundamental change in the mineralogy. You can't just compress the same stuff and get that, get the observed uh, velocity structure. Next slide. This is a, a similar analysis, someone else, same basic conclusions that the P wave velocity is seven or eight kilometers per second. Um, you can also use that to infer something about the temperature with depth where you get down to about 800 degrees centigrade at 400 kilometers and you get down in above 1,000 degrees at 1,000 kilometers. Um, the velocities, as I said, can also be, be used to indicate something about the composition. The upper mantle is some sort of peroxinite. The lower mantle is more magnesium, magnesium rich. Next slide. Um, you can also use, when you hit something like the moon, either with an earthquake or a big impact event, in addition to the, the seismic event, it kind of rings um, 
with a, a series of oscillations, and these can be used to infer properties about the, the mantle, about the S-wave velocity and the, and the density, uh, but the picture is, is fairly similar. You, you get an increase in velocity with depth, you get an increase of density with depth, um, and, and it produces a, a generally similar picture to, to what the other kind of analyses have shown. Next slide. Do different materials in the core uh, affect the velocity? Yes. Um, different minerals have different seismic velocities. Um, as an extreme example on the Earth, if you go to the mid-ocean ridges where the crust is moving away as it's formed, you can also get a directional anisotropy because the minerals tend to line up in a particular orientation. And, and if you had a big enough mineral grain, um, the velocity in one direction would be different than the velocity in another direction through a grain. So there's compositional variations um, given the way the you know, it, it, you don't usually see this in the Earth very much, except in, in specific environments. But there's a there's a crystallographic variation in the velocity as well. Are they using that? Are they, do they are they able to develop any models based on that to 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 kind of tease out some of the layers? Y yes and no. Um, there's enough uncertainty in the velocity that there's a lot of minerals that will fit in that uncertainty. Um, given the potential range of minerals. There's not a lot of, of variation in the velocity anyway, so it's hard to use the velocity to do a whole lot in terms of the mineralogy. You can say, all right, well, it's consistent with a mafic composition. Um, we do observe the velocity increases. Well, how can you explain that? Well, if you put more magnesium in, that'll make the velocity go up. But but it doesn't prove it. It's just a model. You can apply uh, a lot of different variables. Yeah, I mean... It, there's some self-consistency. We understand we have samples from the moon. We understand basically about its bulk chemistry. So it's not like you can have the interior of the moon be granite from the chemical arguments. So it's got to be some kind of mafic mineral. All right, what kind of mafic minerals exist? These these are consistent with the seismic velocities, but it's it's non-unique. Next slide. What do we know about the core? Um, well, the assumption has always been that that it's iron, um, like the Earth, but um, it, it could also be some kind of iron or titanium rich silicate composition um, which would be equally dense. The question is whether you believe the inner and outer core is solid or liquid, um, you can use different compositions. Um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of data sets that have been used to um, estimate the size of the core. Um, the chemistry has been used to argue for a small core with a radius of a few hundred kilometers. Um, the moment of inertia of the moon is, is pretty close to a a uniform density sphere, which means you can't have a very big lunar iron core, uh, but you could have a couple hundred, 300 kilometers. If it's iron and solid, if it's a liquid iron, iron sulfur composition, it could be a little bigger, four or 500 kilometers in radius. Um, depends on what the mantle density is. Uh, with depth, we know it increases, but uh, depending on how much it increases, you could you would have to have a smaller inner core to match the moment of inertia. Um, Way back during the Apollo era, um, Yoshio Nakamura uh, estimated the size of the core from a single uh, far side impact event and got a number that was somewhere around uh, two to 400 kilometers radius. Um, more recently, uh, two far side impact events were reanalyzed and suggested that there was a, the core is four or 500 kilometers in radius, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of, of, of different ways to appro approach the problem. But you also you get generally the same answer that the core is somewhere between let's say three and four hundred kilometers and probably closer to four hundred kilometers in, in radius. Now the question is whether it's entirely solid, entirely liquid, or solid inner and liquid outer. Next slide. Next one. One of the other constraints we have on what's going on in the interior is heat flow. Um, there were two heat flow experiments conducted on Apollo 15 and 17. Uh, the, the wire broke on the 16 experiment, so we never got any data from that. Basically, what was done was a hole was drilled in the regolith and a thermal probe was inserted into the regolith. Um, that measured the temperature as a function of depth and time, and they also heated, had heating elements that they can measure the thermal conductivity so you know how the rate at which the heat is propagating through the surface. Next slide. This is what those data show at the Apollo. At each site, there were, were two probes put in the ground. This is what was observed at 15. This was observed at 17. This shaded arc up on the top represents the, the diurnal variation in the temperature as you go from day to night. Um, so that takes some tens of centimeters um, to dis 
to get below. So you got to get down pretty far, you know, a meter or so below the surface before you get away from that. There are no data in the upper uh, 20 or so centimeters. But what you can see are, are these kind of uh, temperature profiles, and depending on what you uh, you want to assume for the thermal conductivity, you can get temperature gradients on the order of one or, or so degrees Kelvin per uh, per meter. Um, is that, uh, Apollo 17 data, is that just uh, different locations around that side? Or, you know, how, how much separation was there? Um, there's about 10 meters. I mean, they're right next, you know, from a geologic perspective, they're right next to each other. Um, the, the offset, you know, the difference in the offset here and here is not just shows you what the temperature is, not the, um, not the spacing of the stations. You know, eventually, you know, if you had an infinitely long, these would all converge to some uniform uh, profile with depth. Um, but the, the lunar heat flow is very, very low uh, compared to what it is to the Earth. The Earth is many times greater. And, and on the Earth, for example, depending on where you are, um, the heat flow can be very high or very low. You go up to the Canadian Shield, uh, which has a nice thick old crust and the, and the heat flow is very low. Go to some place like the uh, Basin and Range in Nevada where the crust is expanding and the heat flow is very high. Next slide. Now the question is for the moon, how representative are these two values for the lunar heat flow? And there's a fair amount of argument. Um, this lower uh, cartoon shows the, the so-called creep terrain which is high in um, uh, radioactive elements and the Apollo 15 site was right on the edge of that. Um, so one of the questions is, well, maybe there's just more heat there and maybe that value is artificially high. Um, the Apollo 15 site was, was in, a, um, in sort of a valley, and so maybe there's shadowing effects that control what the surface temperature is. Um, there's another argument now that there's a periodicity in the uh, orbit of the moon at about 18.6 years, and the argument is that you have to get below that depth to accurately measure the long-term heat flow, that anything above that's going to be influenced more or less by the, the thermal cycling. And, and the argument is, well, you've got to get down four or five meters before you're going to get away from all those effects, and the Apollo measurements were all made at shallower depths. So there's a, the, val the actual value are, are pretty good. The question is, what does it mean about the actual heat flow from the interior of the moon? So there's a significant amount of uncertainty in, in the bulk heat flow of the moon at this point. Next slide. Okay, next one. Um, there's residual magnetism on the moon. This is what the lunar prospectors saw. Um, most of it's concentrated on the far side um, where you get a few high, high values. Next slide. When you look at the individual samples that were returned, some of them have a fair amount of remnant magnetization. Um, those are all old, um, and some of them are, are, are pretty strong. Um, there are some younger rocks that have uh, smaller field values associated with them. So the debate has been whether the moon actually had a magnetic field, an intrinsic magnetic field like the Earth does, um, actively generated by some process in the core uh, very early on in its history, three and a half or four billion years ago, and that maybe that, that process ended, and so currently there is no large intrinsic uh, field. Um, you can also um, induce magnetization due to impact events. Um, presumably that's what's causing all these young uh, signatures in, in the one and a half or one billion year and younger set. Um, there is a correlation. Some of the lunar prospector data suggested that some of the, the ejected from some of the large basins had fairly high magnetization. There's also a correlation with most of the magnetic, a lot of the largest magnetic anomalies are associated with the antipodal position, the large impact basins, which suggests there, there might be some correlation between the impact process and the magnetization. But, but this is another case where we really don't understand what's going on. I mean, clearly the rocks that were brought back had, had intrinsic from the moon magnetization. It wasn't because they were sitting in the command module and all that stuff. Um, the problem is none of those rocks were in place. A lot of them are, are, were broken up and reassembled. On the Earth, what you do when you want to understand what's going on is you go to an outcrop, you, you get an oriented sample, you bring it back to the lab, you measure the orientation of the magnetic field and see how it compares to the magnetic field at the time that rock was formed. If, if it's exactly the same, then you know that rock hasn't moved. Um, if it's different, then you know largely through plate tectonics that the rocks have moved around. And, and you can see that. It's very easy to, to demonstrate. You can also go through lake beds on the Earth and measure the orientation of the magnetic field 
over the last, say, a few thousand years or, or even longer, and you can watch the orientations change, which is the Earth's field moving around and, and periodically um, reversing the field direction. But, but those rocks are all in place. You understand what happened to them, and so the directions you get out of them mean something. case of a rock you just pick up on the surface that has no orientation, you, there's no orientation data, so all you can get out is the, the magnitude of the field. And, and so we ha we're left with this conundrum about whether, in fact, there was an intrinsic field. Next slide. There are also places where there are high magnetic fields, so to speak, and are associated with these albedo swirl patterns. This is the Reiner gamma anomaly. Uh, there's a bright swirl pattern on the surface. No one knows what these are caused by. Uh, the presence of the swirl suggests maybe there was some impact event, but, but we don't know. Um, these are of somewhat interest to uh, exploration point of view because they might actually be little magnetospheres, which might protect you in some level from some of the, the impinging particle flux. Next slide. One other way we understand about the interior is that um, the retroreflectors that were deployed on the Apollo experiments as well as the two on the Lunacot experiments have been used to uh, track the, the rotational uh, and, and librational history of the moon over the last uh, 40 years or so. Next slide. Uh, basically what this has shown is that the moon is receding from the Earth at about 40 millimeters per year. Um, there's, the, those data are consistent with a liquid core, uh, maybe 20% of the radius. Uh, and there's a whole variety of, of more um, fundamental physics things that have been used to indicate that the gravitational constant is, is stable. Um, we understand much better where the moon is. Um, we understand aspects of the theory of relativity uh, because you can carefully track um, the position of those, those reflectors over time. Next one. All right, so in conclusion, um, what do we know? Does the moon have a core? Probably. What is it made of? Well, that's debatable. It could be iron. Uh, it could be some kind of iron or titanium silicate. Maybe there's some sulfur in it. How big is the core? It's probably 300 or 400, meter, 300 or 400 kilometers in radius, um, but there's a fair amount of uncertainty. Is the outer core or all the core liquid? Well, maybe. There's evidence to suggest that, but no definitive evidence. Um, what's the lunar mantle like? Well, it's mafic. It's, it may be layered. It's not clear whether there was whole mantle or partial mantle convection or any convection at all, which would have mixed the stuff up. We have an approximate idea of, of where it begins and ends. I mean, you know it starts about, on average, maybe 50 kilometers below the surface and extends to the boundary with the core, wherever that is. Um, and you know that the velocity increases with depth, which gives you some indication of its composition. What's the crust like? It's mostly a north acidic with a little bit of frosting of basaltic material here and there. It's about 50 kilometers thick, but it's thinner under places like the, the South Pole Lake and Basin and the Mare. Um, and it has a superficial megarith, mega regolith on it, particularly in the highlands that could extend to kilometers of depth. Is the moon seismically active? Yes. Is it an issue? No, I don't think so. Clive Neal would argue the other way. Um, why, are, why are we know so little? Well, we don't have any data. I mean, you look at the Earth, and there are thousands of seismometers. There are active seismic experiments. There's, there's all kinds of ways to probe the interior of the Earth because you've got instrumentation all over the place. On the moon, we had four seismometers in four places, two of which are so close together as to essentially be the same station. We only went to a few places. They were all on the front side at low latitude. We've never been to the far side of the poles. Um, so we have very little um, idea of what the global distribution is. Now. The GRAIL mission, which will be launched as a, as, a, as a gravity mission, that will provide better understanding of what the crust is like because the sensitivity on the gravity field will be much higher than we have either from Lunar Prospector or even from the, the Selene mission. Um, if, there is a, if there is a network mission, and depending on how it's configured, it, it could shed a lot of light. What you need to define the location of the seismic events is four stations. Right now, the U.S. is planning on sending two with a promise that maybe someday we'll send two more. Um, if you only have two, there's, there's only a little bit you can do. Now, one of the ideas for this is to use these nests of far side um, uh, earthquake, moonquake events to try to understand whether there's a core. And the idea is um, you, the nest is over here. You put one seismometer on the opposite side of the moon, and you put another one sort of part way around. And the idea being that, that the energy that goes all the way through the moon to this far side station will be different than the one nearby um, by different amounts if there's in fact a core or a liquid core or a core of different dimensions. The problem is that 
from those two stations alone, we won't know where or when those events occurred. And you're going to have to make an assumption on that, which is going to limit how, how well you can do on the interior. Now, if you had four stations active and they were in the right place, then you could determine where, in fact, that event occurred and, and better understand this propagation through the interior. Ideally, you'd like to have, you know, a half a dozen or more, you know, you know the, more, the, the more stations you have, the better, uh, because then you can use smaller events that you can't see all over the moon and stuff. Um, the, as I said, the plan is to send uh, two stations, hopefully with two more U.S. stations later. Um, there's a fair amount of interest, um, as John alluded to at the beginning, in an um, international cooperation, but um, beyond their expression of interest, they have not been involved in the explicit discussions. There's a science definition team um, that's been working for the last couple months. Uh, APL and Marshall have been studying different ways of actually deploying the instruments, um, but the SDT hasn't finished making their uh, their report, and uh, the technical analysis is still ongoing, and then there's the question of, of money. So that's it for now. Thanks. Questions for Jeff in the room? Can you spend a couple of minutes and explain how GRIL works, how it gets its high precision? It uses two, two satellites co-orbiting, um, very accurately located, and the, the, um, as they traverse the moon, the gravitational field anomalies will cause, cause the spacecraft to move around. So you accurately compare the distance between them um, gives you an, a very high precision reading of what the gravity field is underneath you. Um, it's a um, it's a knockoff of a terrestrial mission. Um, Grace. Grace, thank you, um, which has been flying for a while. Provides very accurate information. The the key difference between the way Grace or Grail will operate and what we've we've had in the past is the precision with which you can determine that that different position, lateral velocity changes, positional changes, it's going to be very much higher on GRAIL than it has been in the past. So we'll get a ver much higher precision understanding of the gravity field. The extent to which that's really going to constrain the core, for example, is, is debatable. Um, you know, whether it's not likely they're going to come back and say, gee, you know, the core is 1,000 kilometers in radius or it's 100 kilometers in radius. I mean, we may pin down that that it's actually 420 instead of 380 or something, but um, it, it, it may not um, fundamentally change our understanding of the interior. It will get a better idea of what the surface gravity anomalies are, and, and those can be used to infer a lot about the, the more shallow structure. Uh, conventionally in, in terrestrial geophysics, typically people do gravity surveys over, over features and try to understand what's going on in the subsurface. And, and it's a very powerful, although like all this stuff, model-dependent technique. So there's net grail mission somewhere in the 2012 time frame. Last time I saw. Yeah, I mean it's it's on track. It's it's a, it, it, I mean it has its its scientific merits. But one of the key things about it is it's a it's a knockoff of Grace, and so the technology everything's very well understood. Um, so so they're on track. The only the only change in the scheme was uh, originally they were going to launch this Laddie mission with it. Uh, but it turns out there is not enough performance in the launch vehicle for Grail, so Laddie's got to find its own way to the moon now. And Laddie is an upper or moon atmosphere kind of mission. It's an atmosphere and dust mission, but it's at the altitude it's going to operate. It would only be able to see if there's very high altitude dust. If, any, if there's any surficial levitated dust, it won't see that. And the ILN, you know, the ILN was, was given a target of... Uh, Two hundred million dollars for for two missions, launch vehicle instruments, and all that, which is a which is a tough tough issue. Particularly when you you know deploying the size the seismometer has to be deployed. It has the spacecraft has to let go. Um, the uh, you've got to thermally isolate it. That's all very complicated. In the case of the Apollo mission, um, the seismometers were a couple hundred meters away from the limb, and you could for years you could see the limb popping and burping as the sun went up and set at night, and, and now you're going to deploy this thing right under the spacecraft. Um, and, and the objective is to make this seismometer a whole lot more sensitive than the Apollo seismometer. And you're going to be a whole lot closer to the spacecraft this time. So, um, well, not only that, but it required a fairly significant astronaut effort to properly align and, and stabilize the seismometer. Yeah. So, 
is a challenge. Um, and, and it's got to last a long time, day and night. I mean, you know, all these, no matter how many stations you have, the power is that you, they're all on at the same time. You know, if one's on and then the other one's on, you don't get anything. They all have to be active at the same time, which is a, a power problem. Communications is not a big deal because you don't have to have the data in real time. You can always send the data back later. But they all have to be recording simultaneously, and they all have to be timed um, at very, very high precision so that you know when an event arrives at a given station so you can understand what the velocity structure of the moon is. Thanks for coming, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in about two weeks when we talk about the lunar poles.